Welcome to Canada's Pipeline, the silent war of a petrol police state. My name's Shiri Pasternak. I'm the former research director of the Yellowhead Institute, currently on research leave, but back here today in order to host this podcast. The podcast is actually the official launch of the 2021 Yellowhead Institute red paper report called Cashback that looks at the movement for the restitution of Indigenous wealth, the restoration of Indigenous economies, and the movement for land reparations. The topic today hits on all of these themes. I want to welcome all our guests on the podcast today, Chief Judy Wilson, Kanahus Manuel, Matt Remley, and Eugene Kung, who I'll introduce properly in a moment and to acknowledge the leadership of Kanahus Manuel in pulling this group of extraordinary thinkers and actors together as a follow-up to last year's collaboration called The Ransom Economy. You can find that webinar on Yellowhead's YouTube page. Today, in partnership again with Kanahus Manuel and the Tiny House Warriors, as well as the Yellowhead Institute and Social Justice Week at XU, we're focusing on Sequetmec responses to the twinning of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and the exercise of underlying Indigenous rights that challenge its viability and construction. For background on the subject we'll discuss on the show, the Trans Mountain Expansion, or TMX, pipeline is proposed to run through more than 500 kilometers of Sequetmec land and waters, the longest contiguous territory the pipeline would traverse if built in the south-central interior of British Columbia. Canada bought the pipeline from Kinder Morgan Inc. in 2018, and in an interview shortly after the federal buyout, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced that this project would be dead if it were not for the higher risk tolerance of the federal government compared to that of the previous owner. In other words, the federal government could guarantee completion where a private corporation had failed to make the project viable. Why was that? What resources does Canada have to build a pipeline that a private energy company does not? We'll discuss this today on the podcast, and in particular, we'll get into how Canada's appetite for risk involves the violation of Indigenous rights, the criminalization of land defenders, and the crude calculation, literally, that the climate change emergency can wait. Now I'd like to turn to the panelists and hear from them about Canada's silent war against Indigenous peoples in the service of petro infrastructure. Okay, I'm gonna start by introducing our guests. Chief Judy Wilson is an advocate of language, culture, history, Aboriginal rights and title for Sequetma communities. She has served her community for 10 years as chief and eight as council member, and as a strong advocate for indigenous self-determination and for the fundamental shifts needed for the survival of all peoples, including the transition to green energy towards food sovereignty and the restoration of waterways. Kanahus Manuel is Sequetmec Tunaka land defender and a member of the Sequetmec Women's Warrior Society and Tiny House Warriors. She's a traditional tattoo artist and was born into a highly political family. Her father, Art Manuel, co-authored two excellent books, Unsettling Canada and the Reconciliation Manifesto. And her paternal grandfather, George Manuel, served as the national chief of the National Indian Brotherhood and was a founding president of the World Council of Indigenous Peoples. Matt Remley is Wakianan Waantan Hangpapa Lakota, his many roles include Native American Program Coordinator for the Office of Native Education for the Marysville School District, editor of the Native news page, Last Real Indians, and the co-founder of Mizeska Talks. Matt has collaborated on many pieces of legislation, including Seattle's Indigenous Peoples Day Resolution, Seattle's New Deal Ordinance, and the National Congress of American Indians Resolution, calling on insurance companies to adopt policies of free prior and informed consent. Eugene Kung is a staff lawyer with West Coast Environmental Law, working on tar sands, pipelines, and tankers, as well as with RELAW. He's committed to human rights, social justice, and environmental justice, and has been working to stop the Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline project. Kanahus, I'd like to start the questions with you. Could you describe to me what you have built, the social and physical infrastructure to protect your lands on Sequetmec Ulu from Canada's pipeline? And then tell us who or what surrounds your camp today. Tiny House Warriors, we've built... Um, actual homes. We've built tiny homes on wheels. And the reason why 
we we built tiny houses is to be a, a fast way to construct homes, to get onto the pipeline route and to these areas where they're trying to build man camps, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, to actually exclusively use and occupy our land to assert our Sukhwatmuk title and rights in our jurisdiction to our lands. Here in Sukhwatmuk Uluk is unceded and unsurrendered and we have no, no treaty with the colonial government here. And so when we go out onto our territory to actually live and breathe on our land, we have inherent rights. We have internationally protected rights to, to be here. But along with the housing infrastructure that we have built, the community that we have also built is intact. And we have elders here from the elders to the youth, the, the food and medicine harvesters, you know, that continue to come and harvest foods here on the land continue to come and bring the ceremonies. We have the beautiful Blue River, what we're protecting is one of our ceremonial, sacred ceremonial grounds. Also what is surrounding us right now is massive devastation by Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, they came in to clear cut a whole entire area that is our traditional wild blueberry harvesting area. So this whole area was full of wild blueberries. One of our, um, sacred berries that has sustained us since the beginning of time, along with our other sacred foods. This river that they want to build this man camp around has um, salmon in it. It has salmon. And one of the things that Trans Mountain has been doing has been installing these salmon, anti-salmon spawning mats so the salmon don't come back and spawn. And these are one of the things that we've also done is direct action to remove those spawning mats from, from the river. Um, but our actual physical presence and occupation of the land is the direct action here on the ground because we need to have a presence on the land in order to properly monitor what they're doing. Um, they don't have consent. And every day we are documenting human rights violations at the hands of the Trans Mountain employees, the security, the contractors that are involved, continuing to monitor the license plates of men that are coming with their racism and the, just the white supremacy that they come with this pipeline. Um, we have rights. We have rights to be here on our land, to exclusively use Use and occupy our land and to do and to protect our land. Yet when we stand up, we're criminalized, but that's not stopping us. Indigenous land defenders will continue to stand up and take action on the ground for our rights because no one else is going to do it for us. I want to turn now to um, Chief Judy Wilson. You're the leader of the Nisconlith Indian Band, yet the proposed pipeline route spans across the whole Sukhwetmec mm -hmm. Nation. Can you tell us what listeners need to know about Sequetmec governance that would help us to understand your own stand in regards to the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Yeah, the uh, Sequetmec Nation is about 180,000 um, square kilometers. So it's the largest tribe in the interior of British Columbia. And the pipeline proposes to go through 513 or 18 kilometers of our territory. And our territory is held collectively uh, by the title of the people. So we have like 10,000 registered Sequentan people, but equally it could be doubled because of the uh, discrimination with the Indian Act for the ones that uh, can't register. But there are 10,000 Sequentan people registered that live on and off the reserve. And by the uh, Indian Act, they uh, imposed us to uh, on reserves and uh, uh, Canada's dad did a lot of research on that. So we only occupy just just under 2% of our territory, territorial land base. So by setting up the reserves, they confined us there to uh, dispossess us from our land and, and get us off our territory and uh, so that they could do uh, have access to our land resources and do what they want. Uh, that's the state government. And um, there is no uh, consent by collectively by our people. Uh, you might have some impact benefit agreements that are signed by bands, but that's really to their federally designated uh, delegated reserves. Uh, we're still wards of the government, so we actually don't even own title to our reserves. So that's how the government set things up. They, they, they uh, it's the largest land theft uh, that's that's taking place is by you know taking us off our our territorial land base and putting us on 
on reserves uh, so that um, they can exploit our wealth, uh, you know, through uh, the ex extractive resources and forestry and water, you name it, uh, you know, all of that is removed from our territories. And they made us dependent on programs and services. So we get small amounts of money that come into our, our band offices. So it's like really um, managing poverty, really, because, uh, you know, they don't pay fully for the houses. It's a misconception. People think that we get everything paid for, but it, it's not. And it's just, uh, it's really dire for a lot of our members uh, you know uh, to survive so uh, in doing our use and occupancy to our territory uh, we're saying we still ha hold the underlying title which we do uh, as Canada has pointed out we've never surrendered our land we've never relinquished it we haven't been conquered on our land uh, so the government uh, uh, cannot produce any deeds or any documents that show they hold Sequim. And I did go to a, a meeting that was held in uh, uh, Clearwater at the North Thompson Park there. Uh, I think there was Chief Ryan Day at the time. You know, we went there to witness it, to listen and observe, but it was a people's declaration opposing Kinder Morgan at that time. So that's why I uphold that decision. It was made by our people and our elders. I went to the different workshops they held. They were very informing, very, uh, uh, a lot of good facts and information, uh, you know, why Kinder Morgan at that time, now Trans Mountain, will impact our water and our way of life and our salmon and as you know the with climate change and global warming and the open pen fish farms and all of those things uh you know our salmon are already struggling meanwhile uh you know, the um, Trans Mountain were putting anti-spawning mats in, and they were also uh, doing a lot of things that impact our, our way of life, to, and especially to our water. And there's been oil spills already. That's, uh, you know, and I think Canoes were documenting that and doing the accounting of it because right now we don't have that. And, uh, you know, they're, they're going through our archeological sites, our ancestral ancient villages, uh, they're destroying our artifacts and our, you know, a lot of the things that are really sensitive, uh, you know, and important to our, our people and to our nation. It's like erasing our history. So, you know, we, we heard that from the elders that we didn't want uh, our sites, uh, our cultural significant sites impacted that way. But the issue is we don't want the uh, dirty oil and gas, the tar sands, uh, pipe through our territory because it's uh, so volatile and there's no certainty around it and it can uh, impact our lakes and our waters and our streams and we don't want it. So a lot of times our elders say that's more valuable to us than any money that uh, people want to to give us because the money comes in and goes out. It doesn't even get to the people. So, you know, there's real, real issues in, in protecting the water because it's everybody's issues our our land defenders and our water protectors are at the front line but it affects all of us and and the trans mountain pipelines going the backwards they're going in the wrong direction we don't want to invest in dirty oil and gas here in canada trudeau has it backwards and you know uh we're going to be there every step of the way because we have to be to protect the water and the earth and our way of life and also work towards better solutions on climate change and global warming Thank you, Chief Judy. I want to turn now to Matt. I know some of the concerns that Chief Judy shared are concerns that you share as well, sharing the Salish Seas right now where you're currently located, but you're also bringing the perspective of someone who was on the ground during Standing Rock fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline from an inherent rights framework. Can you help break down for us what you learned there about what the anti-colonial struggle against dispossession looks like today? And I know you've done so much work in this area, very groundbreaking work. How can we link the physical infrastructure of these pipeline construction, energy construction with the financial infrastructure of banks and insurance companies for pipeline development? Thank you, Lila Wopila Tanka Echa. Mitaku Yepi, Chante Washtea, Nape Chiosapi. Uh, o uh, Lakota ia wakewana tana machia, uh, wa chichu ia Matt Rimley machia, uh, Ian Waslaha e mataha, uh, un, uh, Ina Donna Harrison uh, e chia, ate uh, Charles Rimley e chia, 
na ki lila wopila tanka tukashila na tipi jikala akichitaki pila on yayapi pila on yayapi thank you uh, for having me here uh, today i'm very honored uh, my english name is matt remley my lakota name is wakia wanatan my parents are donna harrison and charles remley from Standing Rock and uh, currently living in the homelands of the Duwamish peoples. And I'm just uh, giving thanks and acknowledgement to the tiny house warriors. Uh, got a fanboy down here in the, on the Salish Sea and an admirer of the work that you all do. So uh, honored to, to be here in, the, in your all's presence. And uh, thank you for opportunity to share a little bit about the work that we've been doing uh, since uh, the fight, uh, uh, ongoing fight, against Dakota Access Pipeline, and in particular, the, uh, that framework around the, the financial institutions, taking a, a little bit of a step back, you know, divestment, as it's sometimes called, um, you know, it's not particularly a new strategy. We, we've seen it uh, deployed and used in, in South Africa and against apartheid. Uh, when Keystone XL was first coming out, we, we uh, were engaged in divestment uh, strategies back then as well. Uh, though with Dakota Access Pipeline, we, we decided to uh, alter that, that strategy. And I'll get to that in a minute. To your question, um, you know, what, what kind of brought us to uh, a more direct focus on the, the financial institutions was um, the weekend in, in September, you know, uh, listening to uh, uh, Judy talk about the desecration of sacred sites. You know, our, our uh, tribal historic preservation officer, Tim Mentz from Standing Rock had been previously denied uh, opportunities to go and document um, exactly where grave sites, historic sites, cultural sites, uh, sacred sites were located in a path of that along the Cannonball River. And he was finally uh, granted access on our own treaty land but uh, you know, he went and documented that, and he presented that material to the judge uh, on a map, and to show you know what places would be impacted by that pipeline going through that particular area. That judge shared that information, obviously, with Energy Transfer Partners, and it was the very next day that they sent in them bulldozers with that private uh, security when they released their attack counts on all of us. That was the very next day and they bulldozed a number of those sites. And so, you know, thinking about, uh, uh, thinking about it at that time, you know, we, we, we tried the um, legal argument, they're in violation of treaty, right? They obviously don't care about that. We tried the uh, uh, cultural, spiritual, uh, 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 angle and they obviously didn't care about that. We talked about the future generations being impacted by uh, the uh, uh, climate crisis and they obviously didn't care about that. And, you know, the only thing these corporations and governments care about is that money. And in Lakota, we call that mazaska. So mazaska talks, that's when we started that. And uh, to shift the focus to go after the financial institutions uh, who were financing uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline, not only financing, but profiting. And a lot of times these banks and insurance companies, they kind of were allowed to fly under the radar. And, uh, you know, the focus was on these uh, corporations uh, and it, as opposed to those who are the ones making it happen. So how we uh, decided to uh, go after, and I should say, you know, I'm a big believer uh, in, in addressing these issues from any, any means that you can, from the direct action to divestment strategies. Everybody has a role and a, and a place in, uh, in these struggles and divestment is just kind of one of the tools in the toolbox um, to, to utilize. Uh, but anyways, we, we decided to uh, kind of revamp our divestment strategies and not only ta uh, target, say, individuals uh, who had accounts with 
any one of the 27 banks uh, who give money to energy transfer partner, but we uh, went after cities. Uh, the, the, the little bit of money in my account ain't really going to make that big a difference, you know, to, to close and, and move somewhere else. But, you know, even that is significant for individuals who can't make the front lines, you know, it gives them a stake and an opportunity in uh, these various struggles to, uh, to, to be engaged. But anyways, I have a, a decent relationship with a number of the elected officials in, in Seattle. And I knew that the city had a $21 billion account with uh, Wells Fargo, who I believe was either the number two or three uh, bank in, in giving money to uh, energy transfer partners. And so we, we kind of did a, um, a one-two strategy against them. We first uh, went to the, the council to get a, a resolution uh, opposing the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline which, you know, resolution is just words, you know, and, uh, they, and we, we wanted them to be the first non-tribal entity to oppose that uh, pipeline, but it was really an organizing strategy. We wanted to get them on record opposing it, and then immediately afterwards said, well, if uh, it's time to kind of um, put some teeth into it, and if you truly oppose this pipeline and the human rights violations that are taking place, here's an opportunity for the city of Seattle to send a very strong message that it uh, opposes uh, violations of uh, treaty rights and the human rights violations that were taking place. Because the reality is, is by banking with Wells Fargo, that's your money that's going towards helping construct that pipeline. And so we launched a pretty aggressive uh, campaign and got uh, Seattle to uh, uh, become the first to uh, divest from Wells Fargo. And at the meantime, we were working with other organizers in other cities like uh, San Francisco, Chicago, and other places that uh, immediately followed uh, Seattle. The, the second part to that, though, is also the insurance companies, because uh, without uh, insurance and uh, companies underwriting these projects, you know, these projects don't happen. So we've been engaged in uh, very um, different kind of uh, strategies to to also go after the insurance companies, uh, as well as the banks to uh, adopt uh, policies of free prior informed consent. The the second piece I want to say though about divestment is there's a the the second part of that's the reinvestment. You know, there's divestment and reinvestment, and the reinvestment is what we need to look into uh, uh, what we're doing with our our communities that have been. Um, desecrated by these uh, corporations and these uh, colonial governments and taking back true sovereignty for ourselves to, to, to help heal our, our lands and communities. So I really liked listening to uh, the projects and, and efforts that are happening up north. Um, one, one thing we're doing in uh, Yamo Slaha, Standing Rock, post uh, the DAPO fight, which is still caught up in the courts, but we're looking at that. You know, we got a lot of uh, uh, green green energy, 100% renewable energy projects, solar projects that have been springing up. The can, uh, can, uh, community of Cannonball, where that fight was centered, is now powered solely by uh, solar. Uh, indigenous by nature, the the group you mentioned I was with, uh, we've started. Uh, we got solar run uh, uh, food storages. And we're working with our, our local hunters uh, to bring deer, elk, buffalo, and we're storing that in these uh, units in the different uh, communities to distribute these foods to, to our, uh, our elders and, and community members. So that's all kind of that reinvestment piece that, that goes along with divestment. Thank you so much, Matt. Eugene, on that note, I really want to ask you about your own experiences because you were involved in legal strategies. I like the way Matt kind of mapped out the different kinds of strategies and tactics as you shift and adapt to, you know, what's happening with fossil fuels and how they're trying to mitigate risk. I was wondering first if you could just tell us a bit about this report that was just put out by West Coast Environmental Law. Um, tell us what some of the concerns were that were expressed in that report on TMX cost overruns and delays in construction. And maybe tell us what you think the role of the assertion and exercise of inherent Indigenous rights have been 
in the anti-TMX fight. How much of that risk that Indigenous people have created have played into the economics of the pipeline today? Thanks for the question, uh, Sherry, and thank you for inviting me to this conversation uh, with these amazing uh, leaders. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, we released a report at West Coast Environmental Law, which uh, was the result of poring over hundreds of regulatory documents filed by Trans Mountain at the Canadian Energy Regulator. Uh, these were required documents providing uh, what's supposed to be uh, construction updates and schedules on a monthly basis. And what we found when we looked at all of these documents together and zoomed out was this clear pattern of delay and of uh, a lack of transparency really for what's going on. Uh, we found evidence in Trans Mountain's own words, own documents around delays in every single segment or section of the pipeline route. It's split into seven different sections. Um, as well, uh, we found uh, those delays uh, ranged from anywhere from two months to 24 months. Um, and, and when we extrapolated that with previous statements made by Trans Mountain executives in sworn affidavits, we came to the conclusion to project that not only would the project uh, be delayed well beyond the 2022 in-service date, it would come at a cost of hundreds of millions of, uh, of dollars to the to construction costs as well as uh, lost revenue to the company. And all of those are not necessarily a surprise, but if you just listen to what Trans Mountain themselves said, they continue to state to this date that the project is on budget and on, and on schedule. And the reason they're able to do that is because they can move the goalposts, uh, their own goalposts and their own schedules. It was uh, a lot of work to go through a lot of documents to find not super conclusive uh, results. And that really is the fundamental problem. It's actually a lot harder to get up to date, uh, reliable financial information today as a publicly owned crown corporation than it was when it was owned by Kinder Morgan. So there are you know a number of different uh, pieces to this. I think the the lack of transparency on behalf of the federal government in terms of the underlying costs, and I think that's not a coincidence. Uh, they understand that as the costs continue to increase, the support decreases, um, and we haven't actually had a cost update since February of 2020 when when the cost skyrocketed to 12.6 billion dollars. Uh, many are now estimating that uh, the the cost is closer to $20 billion. And that matters because when, when this whole thing was proposed uh, in 2013, the original estimate for the project was $5.4 billion. So we're seeing a, you know, a, a four to five times increase uh, in an era where the future of oil and gas and the future of oil and gas infrastructure is in question and not just from activists or climate scientists or environmentalists or indigenous peoples, but by the biggest financial institutions in the world. And as Matt mentioned, in insurance companies and reinsurance companies, the people who are already paying for the cost of climate change and already paying for this uh, inability to capture the risk related to climate change. And I, and I think there's a similar shift happening uh, with respect to Indigenous rights and the lack of uh, free prior informed consent that projects have, and in particular, where uh, the, the land is not ceded, uh, and not treaty, not subject to a treaty, and where it, even in Canadian law, uh, there, there is a recognition of the uncertainty related to uh, the, the, the Crown assertion of title. And how that plays into projects like Trans Mountain is that from an industry perspective, what they want most uh, and what the, their investors want most is certainty. And for a long time, um, those 
bodies were able to basically ignore the lack of title uh, uh, or sorry, to, to ignore the land disputes uh, that, that underlie all these things and, and look at other forms of risk. Um, but what we've seen over the years is when you don't have the free prior informed consent of the affected communities, your project can have all of the government approvals, all of the permits that it needs, and it's still going to come up against opposition, whether that's land defense, whether that's all this, some of these other tactics we're talking about, whether that's legal challenges. And so there's uh, a move to try and incorporate that understanding into these decisions. Um, you know, the physical reality of a linear piece of infrastructure like a pipeline is that it is going to cross many uh, Indigenous territories. The other reality of a linear piece of uh, infrastructure is that it needs to be 100% complete to be 1% effective. You can't have 99% of a pipeline with a 1% hole in the middle. That's a terrible pipeline that doesn't achieve its goal. And so what that means in practical terms is that you, if you want to get the most certainty for a project, you need to have the free prime form consent of every community along that route. And so I think what we're seeing is a shift uh, within the financial sector to try and understand and price that risk, really, that's partially what the insurance sector does. Um, and, you know, when I think back to the proposal for this project as it was filed in 2013, it's impossible to, to imagine a world where that, where it would be filed today and be successful, right? The only things keeping the project alive are essentially political hubris um, and uh, people not wanting to go back on what they said they were going to do. And so, um, we're in a, a moment of change globally uh, as it relates to, to climate change, but also as it relates to Indigenous rights, because those two are obviously connected. And what people are looking for solutions, looking for plausible alternative ways to, to make decisions where uh, profit is not the only motivator for, for those decisions. And so I think there, um, you know, Trans Mountain is an example of that. Uh, we know that Kinder Morgan ran away from the project uh, back in 2018 because of these risks that they were facing and because they weren't able to raise uh, the capital to fund the project. And that was why uh, the Canadian government had to, to step in, buy it at a premium. Uh, Kinder Morgan did fine at the end. And now it's the Canadian public who are saddled with this uh, massive project that is almost certainly going to become a stranded asset before it's paid off, which represents a huge liability. Thank you so much, Eugene. I want to pick up on something you said and put a question to Kanahus and to Chief Judy. That point that you made about um, keeping the project alive, you know, given that the economic feasibility of the project has been questioned, not just in your report by economist Robin Allen as well, who's looked at the numbers and found them completely reckless and misleading, um, we know about the fossil fuels and their relationship to climate change and so on. There's so many reasons that the project shouldn't be kept alive. 16th insurer of Trans Mountain just pulled out, refusing to insure. We have all of this economic and ecological risk. And yet, Canahoos Manual and the Tiny House Warriors are under constant surveillance, monitoring, arrests, threats, charges intimidation, harassment. So if all the financial backers are pulling out, why are the police moving in right now? I wanna put that question to Kanahus and to Chief Judy to talk about the um, relationship or the role of the police and the military in securing this infrastructure for the state. Well, right from the start, it's been a conflict of interest for the state government to purchase the Kinder Morgan. They did it without the consent of the Indigenous people, but they also did it without the consent of the taxpayers of Canada. So the conflict of interest where the state government is supposed to consult with us, and now with Bill C-15 and Bill uh, 41, they're supposed to have free prior informed consent, so that doesn't meet any of those uh, minimum human rights standards. And it's... Uh, 
international human right violations with the uh, state government to use the state uh, RCMP and the surveillance of military against indigenous people. Uh, there's already been the United Nations, you know, sent letters out um, in regards to Canada's uh, uh, behavior and con uh, conduct at what they're doing with the Wet'suwet'en and, and the Sequatin. And, uh, you know, they're choosing to ignore it, but they will still, you know, accept, you know, the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which are minimum human rights. And so they're already violating those by uh, doing what they're doing to uh, both what the tiny house warriors and the tree, uh, Burnaby tree sitters, uh, you know, many who are non-Indigenous as well. And, and also that, uh, you know, the different old growth sites with Ferry Creek and also the LNG with the Witsuit. And, you know, they, they're very selective at singling out the Indigenous land defenders in regards to protecting the land and the water. So I really feel, and I'll keep saying that, that Canada's in a conflict of interest. They're uh, choosing their own uh, state-owned pipeline interests uh, over their uh, obligations in regard to uh, human rights and also obligations uh, in regard to our constitutionally protected rights and also the Indigenous, the Sequentum, uh laws and uh, jurisdiction and legal orders, which I we already explained, they do not have our consent, and they do not have the uh, legal rights uh, because our our laws are still intact over the land, and so is our uh, our title. Yes, the, the RCMP's involvement right now on the ground with the indigenous resistance and land occupation um, here with the tiny house lawyers in opposition to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. We've been here for three years. Um, this will be the fourth winter that we're here at Blue River. And from day one of our land occupation, we've had constant interference by the RCMP, government workers, contractors that continue to harass us on a daily basis for asserting our title and rights here on the land. Really, people really need to understand the, the magnitude of our Aboriginal title and rights, which includes economic rights which includes our right to make decisions, our right to our own leadership. And uh, it needs to be very clear who the proper uh, and rightful title holders are. And when you dig deeper, it's the people. It's the people collectively on the ground, as you heard Chief Judy Wilson state. Um, the RCMP, as I've, I've heard how this is referred to as our, from our Southern relatives is that it is a petrol police state. Um, every corner you take on these roads, you're going to bump up into Trans Mountain Security or RCMP. And the RCMP actually invented and developed a new division within, within their um, policing called the Community Industry Response Group. And this is specifically to monitor Indigenous um, people on the ground that are opposed to this pipeline or any type of resistance or protest against any type of uh, infrastructure or resource extraction infrastructure. Um, it's the same police that went in on the Wet'suwet'en raid, Indigenous people standing up against the coastal gas link. It's also the same RCMP division that's at Ferry Creek and all the police violence that's happening at the hands of the RCMP there is the Community Industry Response Group. Um, I also have a lawsuit against the uh, Community Industry Response Group, RCMP, um, because of the violence and the injuries that they caused on one of the arrests on our land and on within this pipeline route. Um, it's not just at the hands of the RCMP, it's also at the hands of the Trans Mountain Security, who has become very like uh, their own policing agency out here. Um, we've found that one of the main security uh, leads out here at Blue River where we're living and along this segment of the Trans Mountain Line is head by a uh, former RCMP. This man has an extensive uh, history working for the RCMP over 25 years in um, special operations. The government of Canada cannot extinguish our title and rights. And they're trying to make it look as if there's native 
consent or that they have this free prior informed consent from indigenous people by um, convincing brown businessmen to um, buy this project, this whole pipeline. And it's a bad business deal investment, no matter what you look at it. Alberta has a big um, investment into this pipeline as well, because the this, this bitumen, they want to pipe through this transportation system, which is this pipeline is coming from the Alberta tar sands. And this um, resource, this raw resource, this dill bit, this bitumen, it's landlocked in Alberta. And it has to go through multiple, multiple choke points through some of the most aggressive mountains in Canada in order to get to tidewater. And that's the risk. That's a major, major risk that Trans Mountain and the Canadian government is facing, especially where they're not recognizing um, Aboriginal title on the ground. When these spills happen, no, they don't document it. They lie about it. We caught them in lies at the Darfield pumping station. They said 100 liters. The next thing you know, by documenting it and be there and going past their security line into the actual spill site on Facebook Live, they are forced to tell the truth and they had to admit to the 10,000 liters spilled instead of the 100 or whatever liters they were trying to say prior. So monitors on the ground are very important to catch Canada in these illegal acts and these illegal constructions and, and operating without permits, et cetera, et cetera. It's important for us to be on the ground and they know it and we're criminalized for doing so. We can't even properly monitor because we can't even get behind the fences. We're monitoring on the outside of the fences. You know, Canada should allow our monitors behind those lines to properly monitor what is happening on our territories because we have experts. We have trained experts in our Sukhwatmuk Nation to properly monitor map um, what's happening um, so we can catch them and because we can stop them. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, this act of removing Indigenous peoples from their lands and territories in order to facilitate uh, industrial resource extraction is the very origin DNA of the RCMP. It was why it was originally created. And so um, it's not a huge surprise, as disgusting as it is to see these excessive use of force. Um, and it's not the first time we've seen this movie either, right? There were a host of complaints filed against the RCMP for excessive force in El Sepoktuk, uh, for example, out in uh, New Brunswick. Uh, those went through the, uh, you know, the civilian body that, that receives complaints, and they agree that excessive force was used. Unfortunately, that report then went and sat on the desk of the RCMP uh, head commissioner and remains there without any action, without any changes at all. Um, similarly, uh, as what Ferry Creek was also mentioned on the other side of the country, what's been related to a forestry dispute um, where a court case filed by the Canadian Association of Journalists uh, uh, criticizing uh, the RCMP for setting up exclusion zones and not letting the media do their job of witnessing and reporting on what was happening. Um, the courts have said that that was illegal, yet they continue to do that today as a tactic. And so it's very concerning, of course, I, I just want to echo what Kanahus was saying around, in addition to the RCMP, who, even though it's not that effective, have at least some accountability bodies, uh, these private security uh, folks hired by Trans Mountain in unmarked vehicles who will not ever identify themselves, uh, in some cases, as we understand, are former uh, RCMP officers themselves, that is a whole nother level of uh, state of creepy uh, incursion of security culture. Uh, and, and it's especially bad when it's not just the state, but a corporation run by the state uh, who are all collaborating together. Thank you, Eugene. I'm sure many people don't know the history of the RCMP in Canada, but Indigenous people are more than well aware. 
I want to put a final question to the panel, and I want to start with Matt, who's already sowed the seeds of this final round of questions when he talked about the opposite of a divestment strategy being a reinvestment strategy. And I want to ask how Indigenous economies can be part of or lead the green transition and show climate leadership today. All the way around from the, the resistance to the, the resurgence and reinvestment, uh, Indigenous communities globally have shined a light on how other uh, communities can follow, support, and uplift. We have the, the creative means to which to really uh, uplift, support um, our, our families, our, our homelands, and uh, communities that uh, ultimately benefit uh, other communities. I mean, we're even trying this with the the city of Seattle. You know, the uh, the colonial city of Seattle. When we implemented um, our our kind of version of a, a green new deal for for the city, and that uh, a big piece of it has it includes the inclusion of the traditional uh, communities, tribal communities, in particular the Duwamish and Suquamish were pushed out of uh, Seattle due to racist laws in the 1800s, exclusionary laws, that uh, they are front and center in any efforts for, towards a, 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 quote, Green New Deal, because it isn't just about uh, the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, you know, and uh, replacing that with a, you know, uh, clean green energy, but if that clean green energy, renewable energy, is simply um, replicating with the fossil fuel companies of uh, putting uh, uh, mining for, for lithium and tribal lands in the, the Southwest without tribal consent or putting in uh, mass solar installations in uh, sacred grounds. And it's just a new form of colonialism. And that's why the, the uh, tribal voice has to be front and centered in all this uh, transitioning. So part of what we're doing in, in Seattle in, in reviving that is, uh, again, that inclusion and that centering of uh, it, uh, tribal voices uh, that includes things around uh, restoration of, of uh, salmon streams, includes reviving of land. You know, so a lot of things that we might not think traditionally of, uh, or non-natives, I should say, of, of uh, that go hand in hand with um, uh, a Green New Deal or a green energy economy, but uh, these are the type of things that need to be, you know, front and center that we're really uh, pushing for that, um, you know, the, the folks who've lived, lived on these lands, the Duwamish people for tens of thousands of years without destroying and desecrating these lands, obviously know how to live with these lands much better than the, the settler occupiers who have turned it into you know, a, a, a toxic sludge in, in just 150 years. So uh, that's the uh, partnership that can coexist. Uh, but again, you know, some of the projects we're, we're doing out in, in Standing Rock is like, we, we can do that this for ourselves. We don't have to rely upon uh, others to kind of um, hold us up or, or hold our hand or take care of us. We can uh, go out and work with our, our hunters uh, to provide meat for uh, the communities. We can work with our uh, traditional medicine people to bring medicines. We can train our own people how to install and maintain uh, solar panels and stuff. And, and these are the type of things that uh, we've been doing uh, over the past uh, few years. So those are just uh, a few different ideas, including that uh, banks, we can look into what, what does a, a community or a tribally owned bank, if you want to call it that, look like? Like we have that ability to uh, reinvest back into our, our own communities. So, you know, that's something that uh, we again are, are looking into in Standing Rock. Like what would a, a tribally owned bank that is really uh, in, uh, it helps invest back into the community uh, look like? So that's just a, another angle of uh, reinvestment. Well, thank you, Matt. Chief Judy, I know that you are working on the green transition. What are your thoughts on this question? We need to have uh, systems that aren't uh, based on the colonial systems because, you know, they were 
basically just uh, supporting the 1%. A lot of our communities are doing a lot of the same things, looking at alternative banking and looking at alternative food systems uh, like wild salmon and uh, the way we grow our food and uh, continued harvesting for our medicines and things like that. I've seen a resurgence in a lot of that. Um, but the whole point of it, though, is the, with environment, you know, it's impacting uh, the health of our animals too and the health of our wild salmon and our waters. So, you know, we do have to do the important work. There's no way of getting around it. We have to deal with climate change and we have to deal with the adaptation and getting back to a healthier earth, a healthier water system. So it's important work and it's going to take everybody to do that. And um, I think uh, the shifts that are needed, there's a, a lot of people that are looking for that leadership and looking for that systemic, uh, that substantial change that needs to happen. A lot of people worldwide are not happy with these colonial systems because they were, they're, they're oppressed just like we are Indigenous people are and it's only continually supporting you know a very small elite group of uh, government and uh, those industries that that uh, you know are our global industries. Uh, so, you know, things have to change. And uh, I see it in other countries as well, as well as Canada. And we have to rethink that. I've been on different economic uh, post-COVID talks. And I said, I don't want to go back to the old economy because it didn't include us. We have to shape out a better and uh, more inclusive economy that's uh, friendlier or to our earth and to our water and to our salmon. So, uh, it's going to be a lot of work. I think it's better off leaving the dirty oil and gas tar sands oil in the ground, as many uh, other people I've heard say that too, because it's just costing too much. And it's like um, a carbon bomb, really. They said if you continue to take tar sand oil. And I know they're trying to buy more land around different areas because I talked to other chiefs and other nations where there's potential tar sands there too in other areas. And um, they're they're blocking them and they're trying not to but again you know they're they're buying up all these other potential tar sand areas and it's it's the worst thing for uh, the emissions and it's the worst thing for climate change and global warming and we all have to work very hard to keep that tar sand in the oil and look at alternative uh, energy and heating uh, as uh, you know what's being spoken about today and there is a lot of technology out there there's a lot but Canada uh, the government keeps it out of Canada you know and we have a lot of innovation happening and that's 20 billion dollars I was thinking where could that money be invested my goodness uh, you know could it be invested in uh, drinking water could it be invested in better Better housing? Could it be invested in, you know, making these uh, economic decisions that we're talking about, you know, uh, better choices for people? That $20 billion could have went a long way for a lot of people, including Indigenous people. So to me, the Trudeau government is is not investing very well at all. I think it's going backwards and we need to correct that, but it's the people that we have to work with to correct that. And there's more and more people coming. If they arrest us, there's still thousands of more behind us. And that's what's happening all over uh, here in BC and in Canada and worldwide. Uh, so the people are standing up and we have, to, they're all walks of life. So uh, they're, they're seeing, you know, this needs to change and they're putting their voices to action and, We'll continue doing that in Blue River. We'll continue doing that in Burnaby and and over, you know, wherever it's needed uh, to continue uh, changing the narrative that Canada has bought into. And it's the, they're writing their own narrative. They can change it. Cancel Trans Mountain. Thank you. I want to give um, Kanahus Manuel the last word on this question. How can Indigenous economies be part of the green transition and climate leadership? Indigenous economies I mean so much to us as Indigenous peoples, um, although people don't relate to that word economy, but it's in everything that we do and live and breathe and eat as Indigenous people. We've always been able to, to benefit from our lands, but in a very reciprocal relationship with our lands. And so this relationship with our lands, um, it was able to keep our land intact and our land is our economy. And so when the white people and the settlers first came here, they came to a very bountiful and wealthy economy. And that was our indigenous economy. It was based on land, like anywhere else in the world is based on land. 
um, yet we didn't extract all the resources to destroy the land for our basic human needs, which, you know, everyone still needs it today, food, clothes, shelter, and water. We all know what we need in our in our basic human existence to live. Um, I think that some of the transitioning is going to come from shifting from this um, notion that people still continue to live under here in Canada, which is the doctrines of discovery. Um, no, our, our land wasn't empty for the taking, and we have to really get out of that notion and really look at the true um, owners of the land. And from that, you're going where the whole world is going to learn from Indigenous people, just like the whole world learned from Indigenous Indigenous people around farming and gardening and weaving and making, you know, pots that could carry water with cedar roots. Like that's the technology that our people had. That's the advanced economies that our people had. That traditional economies were continued to live under, and that's our moose, our, our deer, our salmon, our traditional foods and medicines. And not all of our people will want to, you know, share that with the rest of the world because it's a limited source for our people on our land. But some of the transitioning into different economies that we can see um, is organic food with our food sovereignty and hemp and cannabis, you know, even these micro banks and micro lending for our people, homes, art, caregiving, you know, birth, you know, birth to the elders, we need caregivers, and that's going to make a better planet, you know, health and wellness, as Indigenous people, we need to put a lot of effort into that because of the residential schools, because of colonization, because of the constant genocide and bombardment of attacks that we continue to face by colonialism. Um, Indigenous economies, you know, diving into that full force and really being proactive in it um, is building our nation to nation um, alliances through our economies. We used to trade our Skosa for the Uligan Greece. You know, that was that was gallon for gallon trade. It takes a lot of work for both of those. We know the value of that. Our value, and when we talk about economy and economists will know this, they talk about value. And our value is a lot different than this Western way of thinking about, you know, monetary value. And we face off with that every time there's an injunction hearing, because they'll pull up the balance of inconvenience, and they're going to talk about value and investment and who invested more into this project. Well, we're going to have to look at our Indigenous economies and put value to it, because that's what's actually making Canada thrive and survive is our economy and they've gotten very wealthy off of it. And once we start to switch and shift over to looking at who the proper decision makers and, and the true original um, title holders to the land, because when you're talking about title, you're talking about every rock has Sikhwatmuk title in it. Every tree has Sikhwatmuk title. All the water has Sikhwatmuk title. And you touch that, you remove that, you have to compensate for that. And that's what Canada has not, has not been doing, is compensating for the theft of all the resources that they have touched and interfered with that has that Indigenous title in. And that's the risk and uncertainty that goes along with investing in areas where there's Indigenous land conflict, and especially here in BC where there's unceded lands. Canada has not dealt with the BC land question, and that's their unceded title territory here in, in so-called BC. So there's going to be a lot more popping off. Um, you're going to see a lot more um, conflict until Canada can Canada implements our title on the ground here in Sukhumagulu. Thank you, Kanahus Manuel, and thank you to all of our panelists, Chief Judy Wilson, Matt Remley, Eugene Kung. It's been an absolutely electrifying hour, and I want to thank you so kindly for your time on behalf of the Yellowhead Institute, and thank you to Kanahus for co-organizing with the Tiny House Warriors and inviting these panelists to come and join us. I want to bid you good night and thank you again um, for honoring us with your uh, with your thoughts this evening. Thank you, Ken Hus Manuel, and thank you to all our panelists, Chief Judy Wilson, Matt Remley, and Eugene Kung. It's been an absolutely incredible hour. 
And I want to thank you so kindly for your time on behalf of the Yellowhead Institute. Yellowhead Institute's latest red paper, Cashback, looks at how the dispossession of Indigenous lands nearly destroyed Indigenous economic livelihoods. Cashback is about restitution from the perspective of stolen wealth. To learn more, please visit cashback.yellowheadinstitute.org. And to learn more about the work Canahus Manual is doing with the Tiny House Warriors to defend Sequetmec territory against the Trans Mountain Pipeline, please visit tinyhousewarriors.com.